Hello and good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to Essentials for Financial Advisors. My name is Dale Franklin. It's, uh, it's a pleasure uh, to welcome you all again, and thanks uh, for joining us for what should be a really good and informative session. Um, as an interesting aside, uh, who wants to be a millionaire first aired in 1998, which was 33 years ago? And, uh, and I, when I thought about this title, I thought perhaps who wants to be a millionaire is not as appealing as who wants to be a multimillionaire. So, so hopefully we, we can take you through some of that today. Um, in today's session, we're going to have Liam Hector and Mike Resty, who are going to take us through valuations of listed financial services businesses. And they'll show insights and hopefully decode some of the mysteries of what makes a great financial services business. Henry Biddlecombe and um, Peter Armitage will then take you what you can draw from this for your own business to value your own financial planning business. Um, if you do have questions, please, uh, please type them in the text box um, and we will get to as many questions as we can towards the end. Uh, the session should be roughly 45 minutes and we have 15 minutes at the end for questions. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Liam and to Mike. Thanks, Dale. Um, yeah, thanks for that introduction. So, so today we are going to try and um, in sort of as, as briefly as possible, which is not overly that simple, um, unpack quite a complex um, part of the of the market in, in terms of financial services businesses. Um, we've tried to simplify them and and um, in in as best way possible given the time and and just to sort of touch on the the key pressure points that one needs to sort of look at regarding business model, the the, the things that differentiate them, and then the, the the types of key performance indicators and and valuation methods and metrics that we look at. Um, so. I'm, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to use Mike, who's a decorated um, bottom-up analyst from the sell side over his career. Um, he's going to assist me in, in explaining all this. But just before we we hand over to Mike, our approach has been to break um, financial services into three silos: um, banking. Um, we'll then touch on insurance, um, and then we'll we'll also discuss the other the other sort of financial services that, that often get integrated with banking and service, but also sta as op operate as standalone businesses. And that's the more service orientated businesses like um, asset management, um, financial advice, wealth management, those types of businesses. So um, before, we, before we go on to those, we'll start on banking. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Mike, who, who's just going to unpack uh, the, the banking sector for us. Great, Liam. Thank you very much. And good afternoon to all of you. Um, so if we start with banking, I mean, essentially, as Liam said, we, we're going to look at three different silos. And if I can just highlight perhaps the one common theme to keep in the back of your mind as we go through these is that, you know, essentially in financial services, all of these businesses operate with a very thin capital layer relative to the uh, asset base that they speak to or, or are responsible for and which generates the, the earnings. So whether that asset base is a, a book of lending, as in a bank, or a book of insurance policies, as in an insurer, or a book of assets under management, um, you know, essentially the model is one in which you charge a very thin margin. <clears throat> and because of that thin capital layer, that margin gets geared up to generate what is a very attractive, we hope, return on equity. Um, and in the case of a bank, first of all, um, you know, that return on equity is critical because you're required to effectively back each loan you make. The regulator forces you to hold some capital against it. And essentially, the higher your return on equity, the greater the sort of fuel you are creating to fund your growth going forward. Um, so when we talk to valuation methodologies, I really wanted to focus on perhaps the more unique ones to banking, insurance. Um, and asset management. I think most people are probably familiar with price earnings ratios and dividend yields. Um, but really the unique one that people typically look at when it comes to banking is, is price to book, which is essentially the value as a multiple of your net asset value. Now, why is it so relevant to banks? I think part of the reason is that 
your asset value is a very relevant and current number. If you compare, say, a bank to a you know a factory where the the infrastructure was built 40 years ago, you know the net asset value of that factory might have very little relevance to you know its current value. Where in a bank, because essentially it's all going into loans and financial instruments, the, the value is very current. So the ra- the NAV is relevant. Um, and the other issue really is that because you're forced to, as I said earlier on, back each loan with capital, that net asset value is the fuel that essentially drives your growth. And really what you will see, and we'll show a slide or two on this just now, is the higher your return on equity, the greater the multiple of your net asset value that investors will pay. Um, and, uh, you know, what you can see on this slide, um, what I've done is I've shown how over time um, the price to book has trended as in relation to the return on equity that the, the, the South African banks have been delivering. Now, I must say, I, in, in a way, I'm glad that the financial crisis has happened because it actually looks like a fairly benign world that we were living in. Uh, between 2012 and, and 2019. So I don't know if it was a function of creative accounting, but the return on equity of the banks was actually fairly stable. However, you can see that around 2015, we did have a little bit of a dip in returns. And you can see that certainly when you look at how volatile the, the, the rating that the market applied to to the banks at that time, that it's a, it's a pretty, uh, how can I put it, a, and up and down, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fickle beast, and the market tends to overreact to fairly small movements and returns. So you saw the banks derate quite significantly in, when we saw that drop off in returns. Uh, thereafter, we saw returns recovering quite nicely, and as a result, you saw the price to books that the market was willing to pay for them increase from around sort of two times to up to sort of two and a half towards three times. Then along came COVID, and that has absolutely hammered the returns um, that the banks are delivering, and you can see how they've derated. Um, and right now, we're in the very early stages of the recovery, and the market beginning to anticipate a re- an improvement um, of returns, and you can see how they've begun to re-rate. Um, so that's really showing in practical terms how this issue of price-to-book moves in relation to returns. Um, and then maybe one final slide before I hand back to Liam on this. This is, again, just looking at the individual banks. Um, and what you can see here is, again, what type of return is each bank delivering or expected to deliver this this year? And what kind of rating is it currently on? And you can see that very close relationship between um, rating and expected return. And, and in fact, it's quite a geared relationship because, you know, if you look at the likes of Capitec, which is trading at almost six times its net asset value compared to, you know, Nedbank at less than one, it just shows how the market really rewards those companies able to generate high returns. And what that translates into is the ability to compound the growth in your net asset value. And what I've shown in the brackets there is just how quickly the banks have been able to compound their net asset value and grow their net asset value over the last three years, or sorry, five years, I should say. So you can see that because of the very high returns that Capitec has consistently generated, it's translating into far faster net asset value growth than you're seeing from the likes of Nedbank, ABSA, and Standard Bank. And it's rewarded in the sort of rating the market applies. So maybe I'm gonna hand back to Liam, who will chat about these particular attributes that we look for um, that translate into these high returns and what makes a good bank versus a poor bank. Thanks, Mike. Okay, so so, so the very high level ones, and as you can imagine, I mean, these businesses are, are pretty diverse, uh, complex beasts, but if we try and simplify File them down to to the main points. Um, the thing, the 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 elements that are really going to drive the profitability of these businesses and and ultimately the ratings that they trade at to book value will be things like um, the spread that they are able to charge between the money that they accept as deposits um, on, on the liability side and then what they're able to lend out to um, on the asset side. So that that creates the net interest margin. Um, as Mike alluded to earlier. There's a very thin layer of shareholders' capital, really, in, in these businesses. Um, over time, 
they've been much higher. If you look at, at, at leverage ratios leading into the global financial crisis, they, they could have been almost three times higher, particularly in the, in, in the US um, compared to um, where they are now. Um, so there's, the regulators have forced them to keep a much bigger um, layer of capital there to protect um, the shareholders of the banks. Um, and, and, and that net interest margin effectively fuels uh, the return on equity um, of the business along, along with things like um, the ability to generate revenue outside of lending, which, which actually f- doesn't need a lot of capital. So we, we have referred to that as capital light revenue. And if you add those two together and, and, and subtract costs, um, that sort of feeds into the the profitability of the business and the return on equity is really that profit um, relative to the amount of capital that the bank has hold. Um, so that, that return on equity then, um, you know, creates some kind of um, uh, sort of pillar that you can use to anchor your investment thesis on because it's a, it, it illustrates the, the growth prospects um, of the business, what management can do with retained capital. Um, and then the regression that, that's currently on the screen is something that we use quite extensively to identify um, valuation um, type pricing anomalies in the market. So, you know, this, this regression uh, from Ned Bank to First Rand is quite linear. Um, but when but you can see from this um, simple sort of summary of where they sit right now, Capitec is clearly the outlier, sitting quite far above a, a, if you had to draw a line, but from NetBank through first round, extended out. And that would probably point to um, something where we would consider uh, Capitec to probably be, be a bit overvalued at, at these levels. I, I'm sure that that, that kind of um, conclusion has been reached um, many times uh, in the market. You might have read about that in the newspapers or analyst reports, et cetera. But this is a quite a good way of illustrating just where Capitec does sit relative to the other banks. Um, and, and the rating that it trades on is, is largely a function of its future growth prospects. Um, so that's just tying back to that sort of uh, the, the holistic view of the banking sector. Um, we'll move on to insurance now where there's quite similar principles um, that are applied in insurance, just from a thin layer of capital and and leverage perspective. Um, But Mike can unpack that a bit further. Thanks very much, Liam. So, yeah, this is the one that I really feared because uh, to try and translate the the world of insurance into a simple message is not an easy thing. Um, I think just in terms of the uh, the model, I, I would highlight, first of all, that this is almost the opposite way around to a bank. So in simple terms, a bank gives you money and you pay it back over an extended period of time. In the case of an insurer, you give it money and at the end of an an uncertain period, it pays you back a return um, or covers a risk that you're insuring. And the the problem or the, the difficulty with an insurance business is that there are a tremendous amount of uncertainties around uh, the timing of uh, you know, the payment that they're going to make to you at the end of, of the policy um, or the amount of that. And add to that the different cash flows that are, are happening in the background, the payments of amounts to uh, the broker that sold the policy, for example, uh, the premiums you pay, and then that uncertain eventual um, payout that the insurer makes, um, it adds up to a very, very difficult uh, sort of cocktail of, of how do you arrive at a, a, an earnings number for the current year. Um, so essentially, very little link between the cash flows of the business in any given year and the earnings that they report. We become very reliant on those um, expert mathematicians that you will remember from back at school who ultimately become actuaries, um, who are the ones that have to uh, essentially crunch the numbers uh, and decide based largely on the law of large numbers and the large number of policies and assumptions around how long those remain on the, on the books, what they're going to recognize in each year from a profitability perspective. And then, unfortunately, as time passes, things change. Pandemics happen, interest rates change, and all of those things give rise to variances against what they were originally predicting. So you can find with insurers that reported earnings from year to year are actually quite unpredictable. So the unusual valuation methodology that people particularly uh, in this space tend to, to refer to is what we call embedded value. And so essentially what that comprises is the current value of the thin layer of shareholders' capital 
most of which is invested in various financial instruments, uh, bonds, shares, and what have you. And that introduces a fair amount of market volatility. And then the, the actuarial assessment of what the present value is of all of those um, insurance contracts that the, the business has entered into. And as I say, from year to year, as assumptions change and market dynamics move, that number can vary quite a bit. Um, so essentially what analysts spend a lot of their time doing, in fact, to cover insurance is looking at the quality of um, that embedded value. How um, conservative are, are the assumptions around um, how long the contracts remain on on the books, for example, and certainly one company where there's a fair amount of controversy on that would be Discovery, where you know a number of analysts highlight that they take a very optimistic view um, of the persistency of contracts and how long the insurance policies will, will remain on the book. And those are the kind of factors that go into determining whether the market's prepared to pay a premium to the embedded value or a discount. And there are a number of other um, sort of attributes around an insurance business that I'll hand back to Liam to chat a little bit about in terms of what, what you would look for for a good insurer versus a poor insurer. Thanks, Mike. So, so going back to insurance, I think that the overriding basic principle uh, is the same as, pr as pretty much any asset that you're trying to value, and that's uh, trying to work out how much free cash or surplus cash this business is generating, how much they can reinvest into future growth opportunities, um, and then you know that, that management's track record and deciding you know what surplus cash that they should release in a given year and, and what they should reinvest, and that track record is is measured by the future returns on capital that the business generates. So, you know, it's it's a it's a very sort of high level basic principle in, in valuing assets, and and financial services is no different. It's just that the business models um, are far more complex than, for instance, an industrial business. Um, so, uh, going just going looking at insurers in, in terms of of the, the more um, attractive structural attributes. Um, growth is obviously the, 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 the main one that, that you would use to differentiate between them, but I think also that consistent um, experience of the, of the insurance. So, so if you look back in time, I think a, a good comparison to make, I was, a, I was an article clerk back in 2011 when, um, when I first started articles and, and one of my, my key projects was Old Mutual. And we had a specialist at KPMG come in and, and, and discuss the, the difference, the, the experience uh, difference between looking at Old Mutual's operating history versus Sunlam's operating history. Now, they, they both obviously built um, incredible financial services and uh, diversified financial insurers uh, um, over many years. Um, but but Sunlam has consistently had a better, um, at that point, a much better claims experience. So what was happening is the actuaries were sort of under, uh, under um, promising and, and over delivering in terms of what their forecasts were. And as a result, they were able to consistently release more cash flows um, from the business versus an old mutual where there was a far lumpier experience in terms of some years having been really good and other years not so good. So I think the, you know, from an analytical point of view, the predictability of, of the surplus cash that these insurers are going to generate um, is something that I would ascribe a, a sort of higher multiple to. Um, and, and, it, and it does reflect in the, in the relative ratings between something like a Sunlim and an Old Mutual. But then, you know, longer term, you want to, you want to forecast these businesses out. You know, if, if, if you're somebody with a bias towards growth, like, um, like our, our company is anchor is, um, um, you know, you want to see a differentiator in terms of something innovative that the insurer is doing to attract new clients and grow a new business. And I think, you know, look no further than, than a company like Discovery, which probably stands out globally as, as one of the more, um, you know, in, innovative um disruptive types of insurance models where, where they've really upended the status quo um, in terms of their uh, shared value approach towards um, measuring the, the persistency of, of people on their books. Um, and that's largely tied into the vitality model, which I'm, I'm sure you guys are very familiar with. So discovery, you know, stands out as, as something with potentially better growth prospects or has at least over the last 20 years in, in South Africa, they've taken big market share and um, relative to the other businesses, which are, as Mike alluded to, would be more um, conservative, slower growers, um, bigger cash flow releases than a discovery, which is yet to fully, um, we yet to fully see the, the shared value approach play out in the numbers because, you know, the assumptions are made over a person's lifetime. So um, it can be over a 20, 30 year period that, that you really, um, 
able to measure whether or not the assumptions they've made are, are good. Um, so that that would tie back to insurance. As Mike said, it's not not an easy one to really um, to, to grapple with, especially over a ten minute period. But um, you know, ba- basic first principles: um, how much surplus cash are we as shareholders um, able to get our hands on, and what are the growth prospects of this business? Moving on to um, other financial services. Now, obviously, the, you know, financial services can be a, mean a whole wide ranging um, group of things. We've tried to um, sort of isolate them down into asset managers, wealth managers, financial advisors, and, and consultants. And but but once again, you know, basic principles. Um, you know, low capital requirements for these businesses. They are largely service orientated, so rely on you know key individuals um, making certain decisions. Um, and, you know, over to Mike in terms of unpacking these businesses a bit more. Yeah, thanks, Liam. So, you know, just to take us home, I think this is certainly the easier one in the, in the, of the three and, and probably the one closest to all of your worlds. Um, you know, this is one where really it is quite transparent in terms of how, you know, earnings get generated off that, uh, that asset base. And in most cases, it'll be, you know, in, investments in the market. Um, and because of the low capital requirements, generally those earnings are largely distributed as dividends. So, you know, simply from a valuation perspective, this is very much around a, a simple discounted cash flow. Investors tend to look at them on a dividend yield basis. Um, you know, in a way, it's kind of the, the, the holy grail of financial models, really, because of, you know, the fact that so little capital is required against it. I suppose that that does mean that there is a a fairly low moat in a sense, and that, you know, it's easy to start one, um, but it's all about the brand that you build. So, you know, if we talk about what are the real attributes uh, that that separate a good uh, wealth manager, asset manager, and one that you're prepared to pay a premium for, the kind of things we would look for in the listed space are, you know, what's the sort of annuity income stream that is being generated as opposed to one-off lumpy fees? So, you know, where, for example, there are big performance fees that only kick in if you achieve certain targets, that would diminish the value of um, that asset base. You know, are you seeing good inflows? Are you able to retain clients? Um, You know, that talks to the strength of your franchise. What's the sort of margin you're able to generate on the money? Is it very low, um, you know, asset management in particularly fixed income versus equities, for example. Um, And then the other thing which is very important is, are you able to demonstrate leverage to your earnings? This is generally seen as a um, space where you have a fairly fixed cost base. And as your assets grow because of market performance and inflows, you should see really strong growth in your earnings. In practice, it's proved very difficult to deliver because when your skills walk in and out the door each day, They typically demand their pound of flesh when the performance comes through. Um, But it's certainly something that that really draws um, investor attraction um, in periods when markets are running. And if you're able to deliver that, it tracks a huge premium in terms of valuation. So that's a few thoughts on it. Um, And I'll just hand back to Liam if he wants to add anything in conclusion. Yeah, I mean, I think once again, you know, basic principles of – just trying to work out what the sustainable cash flows of the business are and, and, and what, and as you mentioned, the, the stickiness of those cash flows. So, um, you know, basic, basic attributes would be um, consistent investment performance for an asset manager, you know, like maybe not necessarily high um, proportion of fees coming from performance fees, but more, as, as you mentioned, annuity type, type earning. Um, just before we before we finish up um, on our sort of segment of this, there, I mean, there's obviously some some overriding um, attributes amongst all three in terms of regulation. Um, you know, these these businesses tend to command a very important um, role in society and and the functioning of economies. So, you know, they become very important assets, particularly the bigger they get, um, and they need to have proper regulatory oversight. So, you know, while that might, may suppress future returns, um, it's a necessary evil to have in an industry because, you know, people are placing a, a large amount of their, their wealth and trust with um, within these industries and should big problems start to emerge, especially when they become systemic that affect other parts of the economy or other parts of, of the sector, you know, you need to have a, a real um, strong regulatory oversight um, amongst them. Um, and then just the, 
the the perception around the brand i think is just incredibly important you know like the the, the trust that you place within these institutions they they get um you know like any small um, swing in sentiment towards the brand in these businesses can have a devastating impact. Um, I mean, if you think of a bank, uh, if, if you start to get it, feel that well, society starts to become unsure as to be able, uh, being able to get their deposits back, it can just be to a big snowballing, you know. And I, and I think that um, the, the the way these management teams need to sort of balance um, brand management, aggressive marketing, um, those types of things, uh, it's probably another very important um, attribute to look at. So, so that would that would probably conclude Mike and my and, and my segments here. Um, we'll we'll touch base at the end. Well, thank you very much, guys. Um, and uh, I'd like to take this opportunity. Uh, so, what you can do is, Liam, is just stop sharing your your screen. Um, so, I'd like to take this opportunity to. Uh, to, to welcome Peter and Henry. Um, clearly, Pete, I don't think needs any introduction to this crowd. Henry, uh, I think you, this crowd knows you well. And I think this is the part we've all been waiting for. We're all, many of you are been in the industry for many years and we're all about maximizing the value of our business and how to become the next millionaire. Um, so Pete and, and Henry are gonna take you through about some of the principles that you can apply to your own business. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Henry and Peter. Thanks, Dale. And good afternoon to everyone. Yes, I think um, given that we're discussing valuing financial services firms today, we thought that it would be an opportune time to talk to you about what is really one of the most critical phases in the life cycle of your own business, and that is potentially valuing it um, for a sale. And I guess the funny thing about um, being an owner operator of a, a financial advisory firm is that over the years, we all become expert operators of our own businesses, but we never become expert sellers of our own businesses because typically that's a process that we only go through one, two, or three times in our own lives. And we thought that having been on the other side of that transaction a number of times, we could potentially add some value to that process for you um, by offering you some insight into both the qualitative and the quantitative factors that we consider when valuing um, a financial advisory practice. So we thought that perhaps a good place to start, Pete, would be to talk about the most important factors um, when looking at a practice. Yeah, so I think two things, Henry. One, as you've said, is to plan ahead. So, you know, we, we spend a lot of time looking at our business and, you know, is there an end game? Uh, a lot of people, uh, you, you kind of got to create your business as if you're going to own it forever um, because that, that means that you're going to sustain quality. You're not just looking for short-term gains. Um, but probably the most important thing is have you created value for clients? So if you've created a client journey and clients feel that you've added value to their lives and they've got more value than the fee that you're charging them, you've got a valuable client base. So, you know, we in a space, we're an asset management company. We also have a platform for financial advisors and, 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 and private client business. Um, and ultimately, sometimes we get people throwing some numbers in front of us. Numbers are almost meaningful to us, uh, they're meaningless to us. You know, we want to see if that client base and the underlying people who are being charged the money have been given a quality service over time where value has been created. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And just to drill down into that a little bit, I thought that we could go through a list of some of the more important qualitative factors um, that we look at when conducting a due diligence on a practice. And I think uh, one of the first and most important factors is we look for a diverse and a high quality client base, because obviously with any business, you want to mitigate any um, single client risk as much as possible. But also we want to understand more about your client, uh, your, your client base. And I think um, what we want to see is as much information about your client base as possible. It really helps to understand um, who they are, how old they are, what their risk profile is, um, what their profession is, because it helps us to understand both the existing and the future opportunity among that client base. And perhaps, you know, there's uh, the prospect of a greater wallet share among your existing clients as well. And there's a value um, attributable to that. 
The second factor is you want to see that your client base is appropriately stratified according to age and risk profile. And you want to see those strata invested in coherent investment strategies. And we want to see your book reflect that. And the reason is that shows us that your client is having a consistent investment experience. And it also allows for relatively easy sweeping changes to be made to the firm's investment strategy if market conditions change and necessitate those changes. The third factor that we like to look at is a clean and a comprehensive set of management accounts. And I think the funny thing about a set of management accounts is it gives you very quick insight into how someone runs a business. It tells a big story. It really if you, does. If you see somebody's management accounts, you'll know within five minutes the quality of the business. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think the most important point to make is they really should reflect the economics of your practice. So often um, these are own operated businesses. There's a little bit of a mishmash of business and personal expenses, and that's fine. We all understand why that happens, but it is important to be able to make those adjustments in a clean um, fashion. The information should be available to you and to us. And also importantly, the sources and the nature of the revenue should be clearly discernible. So in other words, we should be able to understand what proportion of your revenue is annuity in nature and what proportion of re your revenue is once off in nature. We also need to understand where that revenue is coming from. And I'm talking on a per fund basis, on a per, uh, on a per platform basis, and perhaps even on a per client grouping basis. Again, that just helps us to understand the nature of your business in a more efficient way. Um, I guess, Henry, also per geography. I mean, yeah, so people true. are being charged in rands. Um, but ultimately, if, if money is offshore or the economics are offshore, that makes the business much more valuable. True. But at the end of the day, this all boils down to, to, to a number, to a valuation. And I think, Pete, you've got some, some comments on that. Yeah, so I've tried to keep it very simple. I think you've, you've had a lot of education from Mike and Liam in terms of um, on the market, on the listed market, what things are valued at. Um, but just to give you a kind of feel as to how we look at businesses and, and, and other players in the market when they're partnering with people. And we don't ever look at it as, as buying businesses. We look at it as, as, as partnering with people. Yeah. So the, the, perhaps a good starting point is, and a lot of people come in um, fairly confused as, as to what a fair value is. If you think a buyer, ultimately, if they use the bank's money, they're going to be paying about 10% on that money. So if they borrow 100 Rand, they're going to pay 10 Rand in interest. So if, if I buy your, um, you know, your one Rand of earnings, if, if I'm paying a 10 multiple, so I'm earning 10 on it, effectively, I'm, I'm in a break-even situation. So whatever I'm paying you is I borrowed from the bank and I paid it over to you. So that's your kind of 10 multiple. So why on earth would somebody do that? There's no benefit. I've taken on all the risk of that earnings not being sustained. Um, so, so that's where you kind of work downwards from the 10 times multiple. And you see businesses being bought at anywhere between three and eight times multiple. You know, at eight times, there isn't much margin left. So there has to be very good reason to be paying that kind of multiple. And you see multiples come out at around five to six. The key thing that we look at is the sustainable run rate bottom line. So and, and it's not really the last year. It's like over the last three or four months, what is the business able to generate from a profitability and cash flow point of view without big one source? And that's really something that you can start to value. So what are the factors that fall into you know, quite a, a broad valuation band? So people talk about discounted cash flows, which is really taking the earnings now and trying to project what it'll be in future. But ultimately, it comes down to what are you going to pay as a multiple of this year's earnings? So the most important things are one, the qualitative factors. So we've discussed a lot of those. You've heard it coming through in Liam's conversation and Mike's conversation. Probably the next most important is growth potential. If you're earning one rand today and you're going to earn one rand for the next five years, you know that's probably a four or five p multiple business. If you're earning one rand today and you can give a buyer confidence <clears throat> that there's a fair amount of growth potential in that number, you're obviously prepared to pay a little bit more for uh, for the current numbers. The next is, is a warranty. If people have, have a high confidence level in the sustainability of what they're doing being repeated and are prepared to underwrite that, um, that makes a lot of good sense and can result in a higher number. And, you know, we, we've had people who've had confidence to the extent that they're prepared to warrant a growth number. And as we've explained, a higher growth means a higher multiple. Um, in terms of planning for the future and understanding the future value of your business, have a key focus on offshore. Um, South Africa, the tail risk is getting bigger and bigger. And the attraction of having a high amount of client assets invested either directly offshore or where the economics are offshore. So a weakening rand would benefit the business is a big positive. The nature of revenue, which I think is kind of covered and, and Henry's covered that. 
Um, cost synergies, you know, so often if you can put a business together with one that you have and take some costs out of it, that's, that can be to, uh, both to the benefit of the buyer and the seller. And size, I think it's very important for people to understand that in the financial advice um, business, you know, a smallish book almost has no value because it, 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 it's got to cover the cost of somebody servicing it. Um, and up until a few hundred million bucks, um, you know, th that pretty much covers the cost of a person running it with some assistance. So the value starts to accrue once you get past a certain level where the, the, the costs of the people running it is comfortably covered. Uh, and that's something that people battle to get their heads around. So a business that's got up to a two or three billion rand AUM, you know, they're like the really big financial advice businesses out there, will attract a higher multiple than the two, three, four hundred million rand book. Um, then people also talk about a multiple of revenue. I think, uh, you know, that's relevant. You work backwards from what, what the value that you've arrived at from a P multiple back to what the turnover is. But ultimately, the same 100 rand of revenue can have 20 rand of cost and it can have 80 rand of cost. So it doesn't have kind of a, a ballpark multiple of revenue, um, which does get bandied around and you know, has some relevance. But ultimately, you, you, you want to look at what the bottom line is, is generating. So that's some of the, um, you know, the, the very simply, there's a multiple in your earnings, which has different factors in it. Um, focus on growing your business in line with, um, you know, the positive factors there. That's how you'll create the most value. So I'm going to hand over to Henry now to, to talk about um, the quantitative assessment and the how and the nature um, of, of transactions in this space. Thanks, Pete. Yeah. So I think we've kind of spoken through the factors that inform the valuation of a firm, but often what also has a huge influence over the amount of value that you can unlock from your own practice is the type of transaction that you ultimately conclude. Um, and often what we see in the market are buy and sell agreements. And that's essentially a pre-agreed um, buy and sell agreement, which names an amount or a valuation formula um, and a, a named buyer. And that's put on the shelf in the event that something happens to you as the principal of the business so that there's a clean deal and there's business continu continuity. Um, and we've seen this a number of times. The problem with these types of deals is that firstly, they force a transaction to be, uh, to be concluded under out of necessity or under duress. So you end up in hospital or perhaps you, you pass away. Um, and, uh, you, you know, these aren't ideal circumstances under which to sell your firm. The second problem with them is that typically they date. It's much like a living, it's much like a will. Um, you write it, you put it in the safe, and in five years' time, it has very little relevance to your estate. A buy and sell agreement is the same. In five years' time, it'll be a little re relevance to your business because it would have grown and it would have evolved into something more valuable, hopefully. And of course, um, it also presents a higher level of risk to the buyer. Uh, in that it's a sudden handover. And, and that means that the buyer ultimately is going to want to pay a much lower multiple on your profits. And it results in the lowest value being returned to you as the vendor of the business. So although it is one way to deal with business continuity and it is one way to make sure that value is realized, um, we, we think it's less than ideal and really it's a, it's a bare minimum for us. Um, the second kind of evolution um, would be an outright sale. And that's when you get to a point where you've decided right. Um, you've grown the business to the point that you want to take it to and you now want to sell it. The benefit, of course, is that this allows for a controlled deal process. And that means that you're now dealing in up-to-date metrics. So whatever deal you put together is going to reflect the current form and nature of the business. So you should realize more value. Fortunately, it also allows sufficient time for a thorough due diligence to be concluded on the parts of the buyer. And also the client continuity aspect only presents a medium level of risk to the buyer because there should be a planned and controlled handover process from the seller to the buyer. So of course, all of this points to a higher value being realized by the seller. And it's a much better deal, frankly, than a buy and sell, but it also requires some forethought and some planning. And perhaps it, it, it requires selling your business a little bit before it's absolutely necessary. And the third type of deal we think is actually the ideal scenario. And that's what we call a progressive sale. Now, this is really where you look to form an early stage partnership with the, the firm or, or, or the person that's going to end up buying your business in the end. Um, and what it does 
is it establishes an initial partnership at current fair value. So you don't sell all of your business, you sell 30% or 50% to that person and you grow the business over the next four to five years together. Um, the great thing about a progressive sale is that it's not just based on up-to-date deal metrics, it's actually based on the potential synergies between your company and the buyer. So let's say, for example, you sell your book to Anchor and there's an opportunity to move a portion of that book into Anchor products that would be a better fit for your client base. Of course, we realize better profitability in that process. And I guess the benefit of that is something we'd be willing to share with you as the vendor of your book. Um, it also presents a much lower uh, continuity risk in terms of clients um, because there's a very gradual handover process and the clients get to know the buyer as well as they know you, the seller. And in these types of scenarios, we see a maximum level of value being returned um, to the seller. And, and for me, you know, if I were the owner of a financial advisory practice, that's certainly the way I would want to, to sell my business. And that's why as you move to the right um, you can see that there's an increasing level of value realized by both parties, really, um, with the maximum amount being realized through a progressive sale. I mean, Pete, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think what's very important is to plan ahead. Um, so planning ahead with a buy and sell on, on outdated metrics, I think, can be very dangerous. Um, but, you know, we, we literally have just been through an experience now where a great friend of ours and financial advisor sadly passed away from COVID. And it was basically left up to our goodwill as, as to how to uh, proceed with it. Um, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to feel we did in pride. But, you know, he, 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 uh, it, it was just a stark reminder that we all need to plan ahead. We can, you know, face the realities. Um, and it's a relationship game. You know, we, we, we don't purchase anybody. We partner with people. Um, and we, like, we, we, we naturally work with people who have partnered with us and, and supported and worked with us where our product range and, and services are appropriate for their clients. So if there's a natural fit, uh, you know, I think the first thing we, 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 we say to people is um, if, if our offering asset management service, service levels um, are first and foremost, they have to buy into that. Otherwise, it's pointless kind of working together. Uh, but there are, you know, there's probably 10 to 15 different Bible bars out there, different people fit uh, different practices. Uh, but plan ahead, form, form relationships, uh, a big transaction we did about a year ago. And that relationship had been in place for about five or six years. And it just naturally fitted into place. Um, so let me move on to the, the last point. It kind of almost goes without saying. Um, but compliance is crucially important. Um, you know, and, and, and people's record of... Um, client complaints and how they've dealt with them is crucially important. And if you talk about two things, you know, if you see the management accounts and the compliance record, yeah. it pretty much tells you everything. You know, somebody who's had a lot of client complaints or hasn't dealt with them appropriately, that's a big red light. I think you walk away straight away. We live in a highly regulated environment. Um, you know, if, 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 if there's a record of people not being fair to their clients, that, that, that means an unethical practice and something we, we wouldn't really be interested in looking at. So obviously the FSCA licensing is, is paramount, um, that the representatives are certified um, and client mandates and the effort put into making sure that the client is getting the appropriate service and product um, is, is, is pretty key as well. So this is more of a tick box than anything else, but, but certainly right up front gives you a strong indication um, and is absolutely crucially important. Um, so that really the... Um, that's, that, I think, is our last slide, just to just un, uh, unshare the screen. Um, that, so, so hopefully we've taken you on quite an interesting journey from, uh, you know, how listed businesses are valued, the different metrics, uh, businesses that have got balance sheets and haven't got balance sheets. Um, I'll ask Liam and Mark to come back on screen. We're going to have a bit more of a discussion. There's a few questions coming through. Um, maybe the first one is um, we've actually got a, a question uh, going through to uh, uh, concerning APSA. So I, I guess either Mark or Liam can, can take this on. They're both financial services experts. But in that, in that graph, um, APSA seemed to have quite a low price to book relative to its uh, ROE. So it, it appeared to offer a little bit of value. Is, is, is that the way we're seeing it? Um, how do you view APSA? Mark, do you want to take this? I was wondering if you... you I think no, no, I mean, I, I don't mind. Because I've looked at that regression a lot over the last yeah. seven years. I mean, it's it's something that I've always used as a... Um, it's just a bit of an underpin or, or a sanity check, I think. Mm -hmm. um, that regression has 
I'll, I'll tell you what's consistently come across is that first rand has has consistently um, appeared marginally overvalued, um, and and the likes of um, ABSA and Nedbank have have often appeared to offer offer quite good value. So that's that's not something that um, I would say is 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 an anomaly that's just come out recently. Um, ABSA uh, optically is cheap. Correct, um, but the, these businesses also. When you know, when we went back to that old mutual versus Sunlum discussion, you know, it, it, you have to take management's track record into account um, when uh, when creating your future expectations. And and Absa Absa is one of the financial services businesses in, in South Africa that has, has got quite a um, checkered track record in terms of um, stability at the core, in terms of their, their key personnel um, and management. Um, and, and has been quite an inconsistent performer um, in terms of delivering versus expectations, I would say. So that those would be the things that, that, that would probably add to the fact that it looks optically cheap on that regression. I think, Liam, I would probably add the point that, you know, certainly in the many, many years that I've been covering banks, I've, I've tended to perceive Ab- ABSA as the sort of franchise that started out very strong um, in the early 2000s and has been sort of donating market share to everyone else. Obviously, the period it spent as part of the Barclays Group and then sort of cast out into the cold certainly hasn't helped, which has sort of undermined confidence of investors in its its future. But that probably just adds a bit of uh, color to the points Liam's made on, on that issue. Perhaps uh, just before we answer the next question, just to remind any everybody that if you do want to ask a question, there's a chat function at the bottom, and please to type it in now. Um, maybe just one or two pre-recorded questions. Mike, while you are on the banks, and we have a COVID question, um, that we have a question around the reserves that banks have been forced to put into place around COVID. And obviously, we've seen some banks coming out with atrocious results. Do you feel that this is priced into the market or is there a big opportunity you see forward for South African banks? So um, thanks, Dale, for that. And and if you cast your mind back to the uh, chart we showed of the return on equity versus price to book over time, uh, you may recall that uh, the last sets of results, you've seen both the return on equity absolutely collapse and the ratings collapse at the same time. And the, the principal reason that that has happened is the creation of those reserves that, that Dale was asking about. So, you know, they've all had to raise significant provisions. Um, and, and typically, I think what you can trust is that from a regulatory perspective, the way this is approached is from a fairly conservative perspective. So you, you raise conservatively and then, you know, the decisions you make around potentially releasing those reserves um, is done on a very judicious and cautious basis. I would say that, you know, the progression out of COVID has certainly been a lot better than and a lot quicker, dare I say it, than, than what we might have thought. As we, you know, right now, if you think about it, we're at literally the one year anniversary of, of market lows and the depths of lockdown. Um, and the main thing is that this uh, vaccine has come through a hell of a lot quicker than um, I think any of us would have hoped. So, you know, I'm pretty confident that the uh, the reserving is going to prove to be adequate, mainly on the basis that I think the road out of COVID is now clear. And uh, in fact, you've already seen offshore uh, a number of the banks actually starting to just release, beginning to release provisions and certainly very little evidence of further provisions needing to be raised. So, yes, I think they are adequately provisioned and you know, I think you're going to see the, the, the improvement in returns going forward, which does make the bank sector from current levels, I think, a reasonably good recovery play in a post-COVID world. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Liam, a question for you, because I know this is a speciality of yours. Um, one of the questions coming through is, do you, what seems to be some of the attributes that consistently come through from successful management teams in the financial services space? Is there, is there teams of people that, that have similar attributes and you can pick that up as winners in the financial services space? Yeah, so, so I, would, I would say that, yes, there is. So 
um, uh, you could almost back them out. You could say which which financial services uh, companies in South Africa have that have consistently um, given shareholders good returns on capital. You know, try and back out the types of uh, co- common threads that come through in those management teams. And and certainly the entrep- more entrepreneurial ones um, in South Africa have have tended to. Um, be able to take market share more recently, probably in the last 10 years in, in, in quite mature um, industries in South Africa, they were able to eke out growth um, above um, the, the GDP in South Africa. Whereas uh, companies like Mike was alluding to um, ABSA and, and maybe like, like a Ned bank um, have, have bled market share because management teams haven't necessarily reacted as quickly or stayed ahead of the pack. And, and I, I would, I would put the better ones at a company like Outsurance, uh, which is inside RMI um, first Rand, which is a, you know, stands out, um, you know, around the world as, as one of the better rounds banks um, uh, t- uh, transaction capital in South Africa and and I mean credit has to be given to Capitech and the way that they've attacked their, their sort of markets that they that they operate in so they, I mean the, that entrepreneurial um, type of theme comes through quite quite strongly in, in businesses that have been able to grow um, but I mean once again like going back to the, the basic um, good attributes of management teams you know humility in, in, in the way that they they communicate um, under promising over delivering um, not necessarily under Real, uh, unreasonable under promising, you know, shareholders still have to hold them accountable. But, but in terms of um, the expectations that they create in the market, they're, they're often very measured in their approach. And it also comes through quite strongly in, in their accounting treatment of things. So, you know, uh, earnings quality um, is something that's analyzed quite heavily by analysts on, on banks because there's so many assumptions. Um, that, that come through in terms of particularly the bad loans books and, and things like that. You have to create an expectation of, of the future there. Um, and the management teams that have, have um, consistently been, uh, you know, shown, shown to be conservative in their approach um, have been rewarded. Um, and, and yeah, I guess once again, also a good temperament, um, through cycles. So if I think back to 2014, 2015, you know, go into a bank's meeting and, and, and everyone will be telling you how they have no exposure to, to the resource sector in South Africa, because that was a popular thing to say at the time, but actually, you know, that, that was a good time to be extending your balance sheet, you know, at the lows in, into some of those sectors and creating some kind of counter cyclicality, um, w- within your, uh, lending stream. So, you know, like that, that stuff only comes through later, later on, but, um, I guess it's all filters into like a level headed, um, you know, hum- humility, that, that kind of, um, golden thread that comes through with these management teams. Thank you, Liam. Uh, I see the rest of the questions are very much based for Henry and for Peter. So Peter and Henry, if you wouldn't mind trying to get through as many of those questions as you can. Yeah, there's kind of two, <clears throat> there's two streams of questions. This presentation has obviously got kind of two parts to it. One is um, the market and, and the other one is financial advisors and, and their businesses and valuations. I think uh, one of the questions is about the life stage of a business. Um, a younger business may not be profitable. Um, you know, cigars have established something. I mean, my basic advice would be for people to, to build up some value. You know, don't try and do a transaction too early. On the other hand, you know, join um, in our private client business, we've got a platform where, you know, people come on and effectively they've got, they've got their own business that they run on a platform. Um, so, you, you know, you don't, don't necessarily have to start your own business up. Um, but, you know, we, we fr- from an anchor perspective, we, we, we're an asset management business. We manage some assets. Um, we, we provide product which might or might not be appropriate for some of these clients. The financial advisor has got to, advi- um, has got to decide. But <clears throat> the, the key thing, and it ties back kind of to, to what Liam was saying, it's, it's the quality of management. You know, I always say one good person is, is worth 10 average people. Um, we, we're interested in partnering with and, um, and working with people who can create value for their clients and can look after clients and grow the book. Um, the, the, there's a question about um, an exit strategy for people that people have a practice embedded in a larger financial services group that they'd like to exit. Um, I think we, we very responsible industry players. Um, I think it depends very much on um, how somebody's, you know, the contract that they've got and, and what the, the spirit of the agreement that they have with the big player. Um, you know, we're interested in partnering with people who can bring clients along with them. Um, we're not going to participate in, in that being an aggressive um, takeaway from somebody else. Um, but people often have a, a book of loyal people who will follow them wherever they are and, and whatever they're going to do. Um, so, you know, that's the kind of thing we would, um, we'd, be, we'd be interested in playing with. Um, Henry, the, 
uh, or would we be interested in investment ISPs uh, or mixed bag guys who got investments, health risk? Um, do you want to go at that? Yeah, I mean, often um, financial advisory practices have significant um, he health and risk businesses attached to them as well. And of course, we're interested in those because their natural feed is into the in investment side of the business and, and vice versa. So it's, it's something we would certainly look at. Um, let's kick back to one or two investment things. We've got about five minutes left. Uh, maybe just some, there's a few questions. Outlook on Discovery Bank. Um, yeah, we, we think that's quite an interesting play. Um, maybe ask Liam to, to comment on that. And then what financial services businesses in the listed space does Anchor like? And yeah, maybe you can cover what we own in our, in our equity fund. Sure. So, I mean, I, I mean, Mike, also please ju jump in here. But in, in terms of Discovery Bank, I, I, I'm optimistic on it. I, you know, Discovery has demonstrated um, the inability to create this like ecosystem that that rewards shareholders of Discovery as well as 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 well as their clients. I think that it's I think it's the right approach, and I think um, you know looking forward, um, I think that it's got a chance to take um, quite meaningful market share in the niche sort of Discovery segment of, of the market, which is your higher LSM in, in South Africa. Um, I'm I, I also I'm optimistic. That, um, that they are able to succeed more so because if they're able to implement this in other markets around the world, I think that it opens them up um, as, as a global champion um, in terms of uh, the, the type of banking model that they want to operate. But I would, I would caution that by also saying, you know, going back to, back to that discussion on banks, it requires a lot of capital. You know, a lot of back-end systems, uh, there, there's going to be teething problems along the way um, and, and also a lot of capital. And a lot of capital for discovery is not necessarily the, the thing that investors want to hear because this is a business that's been quite aggressive in terms of their accounting some assumptions in the past. So um, there's probably quite a tricky period that they need to navigate now around um, around accounting and making sure that, they've, that, that they're expanding the bank um, in an appropriate way, that they're balancing shareholders' interests at the same time. Um, but, but, you know, hopefully we look back in three, four years time and there's a, a really um, good um, online only banking offering in South Africa and, and South Africa is able to keep up with the rest of the world in terms of those types of trends, because that's what's happening everywhere. And then what are, what are our favorite uh, financial services shares? Maybe to run through what we hold in the equity fund. Yeah. yeah uh, so what's going to come through quite strongly in the equity fund is a quality bias. So we own a company like um, First Rand, it would be our preferred bank. We own a business like Transaction Capital, which is a mid cap play in South Africa. But, you know, once again, it's demonstrated over time that um, it's, uh, it's just, con it's been a consistent deliverer, a consistent compounder in South Africa and the quality is coming through. Um, we'll, we'll own a company like Discovery and a company like RMI because our insurance is in its own segment of the market is once again, you know, the, the best in class. And, and I would say that Discovery may be a little bit more controversially um, because of, of things like aggressive accounting policies at a, at a bit of a lower weight. But once again, you know, what we would consider one of the higher quality um, insurers, particularly around their, their future growth prospects. So those are the types of businesses that we would, we would favor in the financial services in South Africa. Um, maybe just one point I would add there is why do we not own Standard Bank and ABSA and Nedbank, for example? And, and I think it probably talks to a concern that, uh, you know, yes, there's probably a, a short term recovery bounce, as I alluded to earlier. But, um, you know, beyond that, we feel that they're very much a play on South African GDP, probably minus. And I say minus because the sort of emergence of the telcos as, 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 financial services disruptors, Discovery Bank, as Liam was talking about earlier, we think are sort of chipping away at a lot of those, uh, particularly the fee components of where these banks are getting their returns from. And that's undermining their growth potential and undermining their potential return on equity, which we spoke about as being such an important issue. So, you know, you can see a clear bias in the names that Liam spoke to around those that have strong franchises and are able to generate those high returns. They have good moats, and good growth potential. Um, and that's a big distinguishing factor that we look for in our selections. I think another interesting aspect is, um, you know, Liam sits, in, Liam sits in London, gets a lot of exposure to the emerging market management team come through there. And uh, Russia has been a particularly interesting one. And, and South African banks are viewed in the context of um, global valuations. And the same global emerging market fund manager is comparing Capitec with say something like a Tinkoff in, in Russia. 
Um, maybe just maybe just a, a minute or two, Liam, on how you view our banks relative to the other comparable emerging market banks in terms of returns and valuations. Sure. Um, so what I would say is that over time, South Africa, in the context of emerging markets, has commanded quite a quite a big um, premium rating. Um, so, uh, for instance, if you went to go and buy the, the equivalent of um, a standard bank in, in Brazil, um, it's going to appear cheaper. Uh, I think that there's, uh, and, and Russia for that matter, um, I think that there's like a quite a big trust deficit that that is formed over time between, um, you know, some of the more uh, riskier emerging markets, if you want to call them that, um, that, that has never really gone away. Um, and unfortunately, South Africa is now starting to fall into that camp where, um, because, of, you know, if you're investing in emerging markets, you're looking for, you're looking for growth, riskier um, type of growth. Um, so that if the emerging market's not delivering on the growth, you know, the rating starts to erode away. So while it's not necessarily an indictment on management teams because they can only operate in the environment that they're, that they're given and, and banks tend to correlate quite tightly with GDP, um, the rating premium that South Africa has commanded is starting to erode and starting to trend towards the sort of mean of, of uh, emerging markets. Um, Russia... There, there are some optically very attractive um, valuations, particularly in the in the big banks. So something like Spurbank, um, you know, you can buy it on a very high dividend yield, and the growth prospects are, no, are actually probably even better than South African banks. But you know, the, the complexity around things like sanction risk um, with Russia has to always be taken into account. So Russian stocks optically appear attractive all the time on 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 basic valuation metrics. Um, that and South Africa is not yet at that point that it's getting penalised to the extent of something like a Brazil or, or a Russia. Um, but you know, once again, we're stock pickers and and we're able to look at those markets and and they they are challenger banks that have come in. Brazil's got an incredible um, array of challenger banks, not necessarily listed at it right now, but they will be in the near future. Um, um, so you know, there, there are examples of of the status quo being challenged. And I'll point to the the big one in. in in Russia um, that's kind of snuck up on the market more recently, but we've been following for the last three years as, as a sort of gold standard in terms of challenger bank. It's got a very uh, similar story to, to a Capitec, except it doesn't have the branch model, um, but it start, Tinkoff Bank started off as a, as a purely uh, online lender, but in the higher risk lending segment. Um, and as it's matured as a business, um, it's branched out into various different forms of revenue. Um, and, and it's got a very high return on equity, very similar to a Capitec in, in that it's undercut competitors in those markets. Um, the market recently has started as as ascribing a higher multiple to the business, and it's been added to Kathy Wood's um, ETFs as well in, in the fintech fund. I would also add Discovery is is, is in there as well. Um, so, you know, they're very interesting, comp uh, very bottom-up specific stories, which is way more in our sort of DNA than trying to make the bigger macro calls. Um, yeah, there's definitely very interesting opportunities out there. And and I guess the, the experience that we had with Tinkoff, uh, we applied basic principles that we had taken from Capitech and the Capitech experience and applied it to something like a Tinkoff, um, which is what what's um, the advantage, I guess, of, of using uh, the multi-geographic um, sort of view of things that you can do. Yeah. So yeah, to tie into that, there's, there's yeah, a question. If I could ask you to take two more questions. And time. Then, uh, we are over time. If you could just do your best to pick two or three more questions. Um, and we will get back to you on the mail on, on the ones that we haven't been able to get to today. So uh, uh, talking about those um, kind of disruptive banks is a question about Time Bank, um, which is sitting in the African Rainbow Capital Stable. Um, does it have the chance of be competing at the highest level? And I think it's got a vision of being something like a tink Tinkoff, a, a big disruptor. Still very early days for it. Um, it's got a lot of customers, up to two to three million customers, but the guys can't really do transactions more than, uh, I think it's a limit of about 20 grand. So it's operating at the bottom end of the market. And I think quite capital challenge. They've just got a big investment of about a billion rand. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's one to watch. Um, and it ties back into, and I'll let Mark handle this, um, an opinion on Investec Bank, where you've got the old established banks and you've got a lot of these guys biting at their heels. And I don't know if time's going to be successful or not. What they certainly are going to do is take some potential clients away from Investec, um, as will Discovery, as will Capitec, et cetera. So we've been kind of long-suffering shareholders of Investec. We've, we've backed the valuation story. It hasn't been a – it's been a fairly good investment of late. 
Um, but Mike, maybe you want to uh, just give an update on how we're viewing that. Yeah, I mean, just perhaps one word on what you're talking about now, Peter. Most of the bank executives that I talk to um, are in a cautious way highlighting the challenges that Time Bank faces. We'll see whether it lives up to those. But I think that, you know, I kind of asked myself the question whether Discovery would have would have actually embarked on creating a bank uh, knowing what they know now if they went back in time. So, you know, every time I speak to them, I, I get the sense it's proved a much harder journey than they expected. On, on to Investec, yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult investment case. I mean, it's essentially a bank that has tended to fall between the cracks, neither fish nor fowl. It's not really an emerging market play for people looking for that, and it's not a developed market play either. So it's been a difficult one in terms of finding what investor group it actually um, suits. It's also, I think, been exposed post the global financial crisis um, as a bank, particularly in the UK, that I don't really think has a big competitive advantage. Um, add to that the fact that it's... Uh, you know, pretty much every year found another reason to pull another skeleton out of the closet for the last decade. And frankly, long-suffering investors, I think, have started to give up on the story. You know, that said, um, you know, I, I, we are of the opinion now that uh, after really what's been quite a kitchen sinking exercise over the last, particularly the last 18 months, it's come to the end of that process of cleaning up its history. Um, you know, with uh, Brexit now out of the way, um, you know, hopefully South Africa on the road back now in terms of, of its COVID issues, you know, geographically, it's in a better position than it was. Um, valuation, very attractive as well. You know, if you back out what's a decent wealth manager and see what the bank is trading on, um, may not be the best bank in the world, but it's probably trading on a price to book of about 0.2 or 0.3. So an interesting special opportunity turnaround story that we think is underappreciated by the market. And you probably don't have to scratch too hard to find 60, 65 rand of value very easily without requiring perfection from Investec at all. And then we're out of there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it gets us by the to sell. I think let's wrap up with one final um, question. It's, uh, there's quite a specific thing, which yeah. um, maybe you want to pose the question and answer it. Here. Yeah, it was a question from Mark Davil talking about potentially buying the book from another financial advisor on a vendor financed basis. So in other words, through an income sharing arrangement. Um, and you've also spoken about a poor quality book and a three, a three times earnings multiple. So Mark, yeah, I think what you're talking about is essentially a vendor finance deal um, with a profit warranty arrangement, um, which is fine. These work in the case of a lower quality book. Yes, I think a three times earnings multiple is probably appropriate. But I guess the benefit when you're approaching a larger financial services firm, and I use Anchor as an example in this instance, is that the vendor financing element isn't necessary. So they'll typically have the balance sheet to do the deal now for cash. Profit warranties may still be applicable. But at least then um, you don't have this awkward sort of income sharing arrangement where the seller is actually funding the buyer into the business. Um, so that would be the benefit of transacting with a larger player as opposed to an individual operator. But I think, yeah, I mean, you know, we, we talk you through the P multiples. If it's an individual business um, with, with an earn out, um, we, clearly there's no growth because the person's gone. Yeah. Um, you know, getting to that three, four times P multiple thing is about, is, is about right. So, Dale, I'll hand it back to you. I think that concludes what we wanted to talk about. Thanks for listening, guys. Um, and hopefully you've added some value to, to you, your practice, and your investment outlook. Thank you very much. Firstly, I just want to thank you all for attending Essentials. Um, it's wonderful to see the base growing. Thank you very, very much to our speakers, and thank you for giving up our time. Uh, just one or two housekeeping issues. Um, it will take us – you will get your CPD points. Please give us two or three weeks for it to come through. Also, if we haven't covered any of your questions or you'd like to chat further or directly to any of these speakers around any of these issues, please do mail me directly. A copy of the presentation will be sent to you as your email address. Thank you very much and uh, have a wonderful day.